Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Shipley, and I'm from the South Coast Healthy Housing and Workplace Initiative. My team and Dr. David Weed, Marilyn Edge, and a few other people got together and said we need to have one of these seminars for, uh, to help promote smoke-free housing, among the other things we want to promote, healthy lifestyles. Uh, this is attorney Christopher Banton Esquire. He's going to tell you all about what he does every day. And he's going to answer all the questions you have about how to go smoke free in your own houses. So, Attorney Banton. Thanks, Jack. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for everybody at South Coast YMCA for um, putting this together. Um, so let me take a quick poll. Are you guys landlords? Okay. So we're talking landlords, we're not talking condominiums today. Because they're going to smoke free too. <laughs> um, so my background is I've been working um, with uh, the Department of Public Health on this issue since 2000, it's about 2009. And I'll tell a, a quick story about how this whole thing got started. Right, so it was, um, do you remember when the uh, restaurants and bars went smoke free? Not that long ago, it was 05. And um, what happened is the Department of Public Health set up a, uh, a, a telephone number that people could call and report violations of this rule. And, uh, you know, but someone's going to work and smoke was being allowed, they could call and complain and report them, and, and that would be that. So they started getting a lot of calls and kind of went like this. Hi, I've been living in my apartment for 10 years. Someone moved in next to me and their smoke is filling up my place. What do I do? Or, I just bought a new condominium. My son has asthma. The place is filling up with smoke from outside. What do I do? Or, I'm a landlord. I've got five units. I want to make the smoke free. What do I do? The number of those calls have skyrocketed. And um, so that's when the department and other organizations like YM, YMCA started looking at this difficult question, getting a lot of complaints, and saying, look, we've got to respond to this. And so the way they responded is basically to develop materials, to look into some of the tough questions about this issue. Um, and I don't get tough questions, but it's totally legal to go smoke free. I don't talk about the process. It's very easy. But to answer some of the questions that folks like yourselves might have, so that you can make a decision whether or not to go to smoke free. So this is a voluntary decision, of course, of yours. Um, and I want to talk about today some of the things that I think you'll be thinking about in making this decision. Or if you've gone smoke free, questions about enforcement, or how do I so um, that's, this is what I'm going to cover. A few things to consider. That's the health effects or some introductory stuff. Uh, then the big question is the financial one. How is this going to affect my bottom line? Look, my properties are part of my business, part of my income. How is that going to be affected? So I want to address that too. The process of going no smoke, uh, to, go, to go no smoking. Um, I have a model lease addendum here um, and some other materials. We'll talk about that. We'll walk through that walk through the implementation process. Again, it's very easy. Enforcement, always a big question. I'll foreshadow the answer a little bit. Um, places that have gone smoke free, landlords report back, very good decision. Enforcement, that, that nightmare has not come up. Yes, there have been some evictions because of this rule, solely for violating the no smoke rule, but not a lot. And that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is residents like this rule. Um, and then trends, that's sort of a, uh, what you can expect from state regulation or statutes on this. And again, the short answer is there are none. There have been none. Very few proposed. This is just happening as a, through market forces. So let's get into some of this stuff. Um, so a lot of things burn in the home, right, in your units. There are a lot of things that burn, from candles, incense, tobacco, gas, meth labs. <laughs> some, some you really worry about, some you don't think about that much. And look, we wouldn't be here if you didn't have 
smoke going from unit to unit. If you didn't have the smells going from unit to unit. Uh, this is an interesting slide. This, is, this slide and this one are from uh, the Cambridge Health Department. They have an, I think the word is industrial hygienist. Someone who comes out and works with property, property owners to address like smells and airflow and ventilation and stuff. That's a healthy building. That airflow. That's not an unhealthy building. That's the way buildings are supposed to function. That too. That's very healthy to have airflow going from unit to unit. The reason that's healthy is because if you take a unit and you encapsulate it, you put it in a big plastic bag, that unit's going to fill up with mold. And that unit's going to stink. And that's going to be really healthy. So the building code doesn't call for that. In fact, the building code, the sanitary code, they talk about the number of air exchanges per hour, and active and passive and ventilation, uh, ventilation uh, requirements. So um, this is a very healthy building. But what this does is it takes smells with the cooking, candles, or tobacco smoke, or marijuana smoke from one unit to another unit. Even if it's the top unit, you know, to a bottom unit. That's all, you know, necessary and good airflow. But you get that unit to unit smell. So that's why we're here today. Someone smokes in one unit, and they think they're smoking in their own home. And their smoke is going into the neighborhood. Even if it's higher, you know, smoke goes up. Even if it's higher, just by the natural forces of passive and active ventilation, that could come all the way down to the bottom. You just don't know. Uh, and it, here are the leakage points. It goes from unit to unit. Um, these are leakage points in even a new building. You're going to have smoke going up where the pipes are, under the door. Uh, you have to have airflow under the door. These are things that are required. So, you know, you get a lot of things going from unit to unit, cooking smells and stuff. Here's secondhand smoke. Here's the, here's the, the Here's what, it's, it's a vapor and it's a particulate matter. And, I mean, I won't go over, over everything here. Um, you can see it for yourself. But I will mention one thing. Uh, it's a bottom bullet point. Another question I get all the time. How do you know uh, when exposure is too much? That all, that all the time from residents and landlords. And my response is, I wish I could give you a bright line. I wish there was an amount that was safe and not, and, you, know, you know, where you could tell. Um, but as a class A carcinogen, that means there's no safe level of exposure. So asbestos, formaldehyde, those are other class A carcinogens. Um, those are also things that are in secondhand smoke. Uh, so, you know, again, you get the unit to unit airflow. You get, the, you get the problem that there's no safe level of exposure, which means really the, the right move is to go and smoke free. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, health effects. Um, the <coughs> issue with the health effects are a lot of people think, OK, this is just the long-term lung cancer. Everybody knows lung cancer. You've heard about the Marlboro man dying from lung cancer. I should say Marlboro men. There's been like hundreds of them. They've all died of lung cancer. Um, but the other health effects are the short-term ones. Right? It's asthma. It's stroke. Heart attack. The risk of these things has increased dramatically, um, even on, amongst non-smokers, even at lower levels of exposure. That's why the Department of Public Health, YMC South Coast, are interested in this. You've heard of the notion of healthy housing. Well, you don't have healthy housing if you've got smoke in the building. And so this is sort of the first and really big step to making healthy housing. So that's why there's sort of this push behind it. One thing I'll mention, um, and you made me think of it when you, you said, you know, you got your mom, your family had the properties in the 1920s and, and stuff. Uh, it's a, the risk of fire. Uh, unattended cigarettes are the leading cause of fire-related mortality in Massachusetts and in every state in the country. Um, firefighters like this initiative very much, particularly when it comes to oxygen and things like this. 
So this is a this is a, a slide I got from the Plymouth uh, Fire Department, Plymouth Mass Fire Department. Um, someone dropped a cigarette in the, in the back there, and the, the fire department actually came in and pulled this couch out. It was smoking, and it was just a smoldering cigarette smoldered there for hours before it showed any smoke. Uh, here's a scarier one. What do you think that black line is on, on the on the bottom? Any, any guesses? That's an oxygen tube. So that's when I mentioned the fire department, they are really concerned about oxygen. They have a whole initiative about safe use of oxygen. Really, when someone uses oxygen, a lot of people smoke and use oxygen at the same time. And the body's actually more flammable when they use oxygen. What you're supposed to do is take it out, let the oxygen come away from the beard and the clothing because it all gets saturated. Um, and, but people don't do that. This is the, that's the fire chasing up the oxygen tube. Uh, the whole place went up. Last thing. Um, let's say you go smoke free. Okay. Um, people say, well, where should I have, where should people go when they, if they want to smoke? Okay, so your, your rule is no smoking. It's not no smokers, right? No smoking. Uh, where should they go? Well, certainly don't let them step outside the front door and flick their cigarettes in mulch. Because mulch is highly flammable. That's a mulch fire. Mom was outside the front porch, flicked her cigarette in the mulch, and up went the house. Um, no one was, thankfully, no one was hurt in this. Everybody got out. Uh, but, and we'll talk about designated smoking areas later. This illustrates the fact that don't just say, don't smoke in the building. Say, Get off my property and smoke, you know, or go go off somewhere and smoke. Um, okay, enough on the health and safety. Let's talk numbers briefly. So, uh, I knew when we started this, a lot of people were going to ask me how's this going to affect my business. So, we tried to um, answer that um, by doing a survey and. At the end, I'm going to invite you guys to come up and, and grab all the materials here because this is on the survey mostly. Uh, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. So this survey is of residents in uh, Massachusetts. Here's what we found. Basically, we want to get at their preference. So the effect of the non-smoking rule on property listing. Before they can even smell it, when they're looking at Craigslist, they're looking in the newspaper for a place to live, they see it's advertised as smoke-free, they're immediately more interested. Only 11.5%, less than the smoke rate, would be, would be less interested if you advertise it as smoke-free. So this is another measurement. Let's try another measurement. How about if they smell it? Wow, if someone smells it, they're immediately less interested. Only 5% say, oh, great, the smell of cigarettes. I'm going to take this place. This is, a, this is kind of a no-brainer on that one. How about willingness to pay more? So we asked that one too. 40% um, of prospective residents said, yes, I will pay more for the property. And of those 40, you can see the breakdown. The yellow is those who do want to pay 10% more. The orange is those who do want to pay 20% more. What you're doing in this is you're advertising. Has anybody heard of greenwashing? You heard that term? Like, green, it's green and healthy and that stuff. Well, that really works. It's a great marketing trick, right? So this is green and healthy. That's what you're doing. You're advertising a healthy building by saying it's no smoking. And so people are willing to pay more for that stuff. Um, so this is, those are three of the questions we try to use to get at preference. Um, I'm not an economist, but my understanding is the other side of the economic question you know, you have demand on one side, preference on demand. The other side is supply. Okay, so we asked them about supply, too. And uh, here's what we found. Um, about just under 30% of the properties we surveyed uh, had a building-wide no smoking rule. This was in 2009. I guarantee that is much higher now. But still not high enough. And the reason I say high enough is because most people don't smoke, right? And most people want to live in a property where they're not going to smell their neighbor's smoke. Certainly their kids should smell their neighbor's smoke. 
So what you're doing is meeting demand. The supply is slowly catching, is increasing to catch up with demand. Um, people often ask me, well, what about the smokers? Don't we want to, you know, appeal to them too, market to them? Sure. Sure. If you want to market to, you know, a very small percent of the population, that's, that's a decision that can be done. My sense is you want to market to the population, the larger percentage of the population. Okay, one last thing on why to go smoke free, then we'll dig into it because I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. This is the one thing that was really surprising to me in the survey. And so what we did is we, uh, we asked respondents, we said, look, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, how much do you make? Your income level? Stuff like that. Because what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand who was answering this, right? Because we all know that higher, in, you know, lower income, lower education folks tend to smoke more. That's just the way it plays out. You tend to have a, you have that, 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 that line there. But what we found is the level of support for smoke-free properties was strong across the board. So yes, there was a little bit of trending there, but it was strong across the board. Why do I say this? So many landlords come to me and say, the people you surveyed aren't the people who live in my property. And my response is, well, you know, look, we had people from low-end income to high-end income. Um, so this is what folks in the property want. The BHA stands for it. That's the Boston Housing Authority. So housing authorities said that as they've gone smoke-free, which have some of the highest smoking rates in the state, in the Commonwealth, even there, they get, when they ask if you want to go smoke free, they're hitting like 80% of the population wants to go smoke free. So you have a pretty high level of support. Okay, let's get out of that and let's get into a little bit of process here. Before we dig into the exact how to do it, one thing we did is we asked a bunch of landlords who had already gone smoke free. We said, tell us about your experience. And 99% of the landlords we surveyed in West Milford said that uh, was a good decision. 90% said it was easy to implement. We asked them to break that down for us. Some of the things they came up with, some things you guys think about, vacancy rates, turnover, turnover cost, disputes amongst residents, all of those factors uh, improve when the property was smoke So that's a little, little sense of, of uh, of uh, what you can expect good things. All right, let's get into the process. Is it legal to do it? Absolutely, totally legal to do. It is. <laughs> um, okay, so here's some things to think about. You've got some decisions that you want to do. You have current residents in your property, I would imagine. Some of them smoke. Do you want to grandfather them? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what happens when your grandfather, let's say, uh, I'm going to use myself, let's say Chris, I was a smoker, let's say Chris is still a smoker, Chris lives in one of your properties. Guess what I'm going to do every night? I'm going to have all my park buddies over, we're going to have a smoking party in your, in your, in your property, in my unit, because I'm grandfathered. <laughs> so you don't want that. Here's another scenario. I've been smoking in my apartment, and you got a new tenant, John, next to me. Well, I see Jack moved. To, Jack, he moved in next to me, right? Jack moved. Sure. And Jack's not allowed to smoke. But guess what? Jack sneaks one every once in a while. And uh, um, so Jack, you know, someone complains about Jack smoking. And Jack says, "No, no, it's Chris next door to me. He's smoking, not me." So it's harder to enforce your rule. And by the way, Jack starts complaining about my smoke, even though he's smoking. And now you're in a whole a mess. So don't grandfather, no one else does it. Um, it really creates a problem. Some people did it initially, uh, and now they're trying to get rid of it, and getting rid of it's even problematic. Because even when you tell someone, oh yeah, you were grandfather, you know, but now you're not anymore, you're not gonna get it. You're just, you gotta go smoke real at once. Um, okay, I, I should say some condos do it, some don't. The other thing is designated smoking areas. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Um, 
You can have them. You don't have to. Uh, I think one of the things you want to do when you go smoke-free is you want to make it feel like a building that's smoke-free. So if you have your designated, you know, have you seen those little smoking, they're like a, it's like a narrow thing that comes up and you put your, you know, those things stink, right? They stink. I've actually gone to restaurants and you see it actually smoking outside, smoke's coming out. That's the last thing you want in front of your smoke-free property. Absolutely not. Uh, so you can, get, you can say, look, there's no smoke in my building in my property, so you have to go out to the sidewalk, you have to go off to the property. Or if you want to have a designated smoking area, you can. Just don't put it in front. Put it somewhere around the side. You don't have to put a shelter up or anything like that. Um, but uh, just don't keep it near the, near the building. You're going to get that smoke. You're going to get smoke coming in the windows, you know, or coming up to the second floor and blowing in. If you do try one for a little while and it's not working out, don't worry. Get rid of it. You can do that too. Um, all buildings are some. You can absolutely do some buildings or all your buildings. I rec I, I'm, a, I'm of the mind, make your life easier, be consistent across the board. Don't have different policies for different things. You can open up some headaches because someone says, I'm being exposed to second hand smoke, I want to have a, live in a smoke free property. Your response is, well, they're smoking in this property. And they say, well, move me to one of your other ones. Ouch. Just be consistent, it's easier. Um, okay, that's tobacco smoke. Let's talk about marijuana smoke. Um, the dispensaries for marijuana, they're going to be dispensing in August. They should be up and running. And they're going to do a brisk business. Um, so the question is, can you include uh, smoking marijuana in your municipal policy? Dramatic pause while I have a sip. Um, yes, because here's your rule. Your rule is not don't smoke tobacco. Your rule is don't smoke anything. I don't care if it's banana peels, I don't care if it's oregano or marijuana, don't smoke it. Go outside. Same thing with marijuana. Even though it's medical, someone will come to you and say, I have a card. And your response is, that's nice, I, I hope you're okay, and that this is benefiting your sickness. I understand that you know, you know, this is a necessary medicine, but you can't smoke in my property. The state law says, state law says nothing changes the rights of landlords. That's the state law right there. State regulation, there's a state statute. Nothing in this law requires a violation of federal law. That's the other thing. Marijuana. Oh yeah, you'll have this whole thing here. Right. Marijuana, under federal law, is a Schedule One drug, which means there's no medical benefit from, from it. Of course there's a medical benefit. But under federal law, there is none. Federal law always trumps state law. Okay, so for those two legal reasons, you don't have to allow the use of marijuana, the smoke of marijuana in your property. How is this going to play out practically? Well, guess what? There are a lot of ways to ingest marijuana. Okay. So someone can still ingest it without smoking it and obtain the relief that they're hoping to obtain from medical marijuana. Um, so that's kind of pretty. And this rule, the no smoking rule, doesn't apply to that stuff. Uh, so that's how, it, that's how it plays out on marijuana. There's a new product that I would be remiss if I did not mention. Has anybody heard of e-cigarettes? Have you guys seen these? Yeah. Um, these things are catching on like gangbusters. And so before I talk about how to address them, let me just say a few things about them. Because that, that kind of tells us what to do. Uh, the first thing is, okay. they don't make products to help people quit. They make products that keep people addicted. That's their business model, right? That's a really good business model for making money. They're killing people too, but... Um, these are not cessation products, okay? What we're seeing is a lot of people are using these and using traditional cigarettes, okay? So they're extending 
people's use of traditional cigarettes. Not always, but often. A lot of kids are using these big time in the school. Um, the other really important factor, and, and they come in bubblegum flavor, and I wish I could read those, those, those ones down in the corner. It was like bubblegum and watermelon. Um, the other really important factor is they're totally unregulated. So this is a funny fact, but they're totally unregulated just like cigarettes. Cigarettes can kill one out of 10 people, five out of 10 people of users. And legally, it does not matter at all. It's an amazing fact about cigarettes. Same thing with these cigarettes, okay? Totally unregulated. This means you have some that are so much less harmful than cigarettes. They're 100 times, 400 times less harmful than cigarettes. That's really good. You have others that are a few times less harmful than cigarettes. So we don't know what's in them, right? There have been some initial studies. Uh, are they less harmful than cigarettes? Yes. Are they harmless? Absolutely not. Do they emit things? Yes. So let's go back to my general philosophy. I don't care what you smoke, take it outside. I would suggest treating e-cigarettes the same way. The truth is, someone will be able to sit behind their door in their unit and smoke an e-cigarette, and you may never know. What are you going to do? No harm, no foul, right? You may never smell it. Unless it's a cherry blossom, you know, candy, from then you can smell it. Um, but I, I suggest including the rule. Because the worst thing is when you come to the door and you know someone's been smoking in there, they come to the door with their e-cigarette and they say, oh no, it's part, not part of the rule, it's an e-cigarette. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to deal with this. Just keep it consistent, no smoke rule. Let's talk about the process of going smoke-free. Um, and you know what, I'm going I'm to give you guys a... Hi, my mom, year-long leases, mix. And it will. So here's what I recommend. And they probably all renew at different times throughout the year, right? Okay, so here's what you're going to do. When they sit down with you, you're going to have them smoke. You're going to have them smoke. Have them smoke the last one. Have them sign that lease addendum. And the effective date is not the date they sign it. It's one year in the future. Okay, so today is March 26, 2014. Thank you. And... Uh, um, you're going to start today. Let's say you've already given the notices, all right? You've already given notices about rent increase and whatever else, and this was included in your notice. Hey, we're going to smoke free. Uh, so they sit down with you today, and they start signing them, and they're signing them all throughout the year. This is a, like my clock. It's a one-year clock. And by the time you get to March 26, 2015, all the leases will have renewed. All of the tenants will have signed those lease addendums, and your effective date is March 27th, 2015. So see, you want to implement the rule. You want to have the rule change when the tenant renews the lease. That's the chance. I mean, the lease is a contract, right? And when you renew the lease, that's when you re-bargain your contract. And the parties can change the contract at that time. You, change, you can't change it midstream. You can't just have them right in the middle say, okay, I'm going to change your lease right now. I'm going to boot it up by 50 bucks. The tenant's going to say, oh, I got a lease for a year. You can't do that. Same thing with this. They can make the same argument. So do it when leases renew. Now, if they all happen to renew in a span of less than one year, go ahead and do it. You know, take less year. Can you go faster? You could make the legal argument that you can implement, like, in 60 days. And you could say something like, this is a a reasonable rule for the health and safety of our residents. And the lease says, your lease probably says, you can set rules for reasonable health, something like that, or to abate nuisances, something like that. So you can you could probably go faster, check with your attorney if you do. This way, the way I'm recommending, takes a little bit more time, uh, but you can, you know, it's, it's, it can't be challenged. Anything can be challenged, but it'll certainly hold up in court. And if the tenant goes to ask anybody, and they're not, because no one's ever been sued for going smoke-free, by the way. Uh, but if they were, the attorney would say, it's part of your lease, you can't smoke. Um, so that's the process. So obtain an, uh, internal approval. That's you. <laughs> you, you. You approve or not. Set the effective date, March 27, 2015. 
letters to residents. So you're sending out a notice, right? You're giving them notice, like, hey, when you sit down with me, your rent's gonna go up, I'm gonna redo the parking spaces, something, something, oh, we're going smoke free. Uh, then they're signing the lease again all throughout the year, and then you hit the effective date, same date for everybody, and you're smoke free. Can you, so question, let's say the smokers are the first one with their leases to renew, can you have them go smoke free right away? Yes. You can have it go smoke free unit by unit, so it makes the lease addendum effective the date it's signed. You can do that if you want, but I find it's easier just to have the whole building go smoke free at once, talked about grand and all that stuff. Uh, so that's that's it for rental properties. Condominiums can go smoke free too. Um, are any of your properties in condominiums? No, they're rental properties. They're rental, but they have four more condos. Okay. 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 So it, condos can go smoke free. Two, I'll, I'll just, uh, and, and we have a model of, of amendment uh, just for informational purposes. What they have, what condos have to do is they have to have the vote of all the owners. You have to own all the units, it's easy. Uh, but you have to have a vote of all the owners basically to change the master deed and the trust the bylaws, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of condos have gone smoke free too. So very easy, very easy process, a little bit more work. Um, This is hmm, a lot of stuff here. Don't worry about it. Okay. Don't worry about it. There are lots of different landlords. There are lots of different types of residents. This list was made for the Boston Housing Authority when they went smoke free. And it's a different set of rules in affordable housing. Okay. Um, even if you have Section 8, do it as I've said before. Don't worry about all this. Um, I will say though, it's probably a good thing to tell your residents why you're going smoke free. And if they ask about cessation, sure, let them know about the cessation resources. A lot of people quit when properties go smoke free. So, large, so municipal housing authorities or other affordable properties, when they go smoke free, there have been some surveys, um, a lot of them quit. People smoke less. So it's really a, a public health benefit. And what happens in those larger properties, to avoid the concern about people ignoring the rule down the line, and eviction and all that stuff, because no one wants to see eviction, no one wants to see residents being displaced. And we have it, we really have it. But to make sure that it doesn't happen, there's a whole lot of education in those, those types of properties. Okay, so for your purposes, maybe you're just gonna give a notice, so they were going no smoking. And maybe you'll say, you know, maybe you'll use this. And uh, so I, I, Diane, you have one, so I'll just give you one. So maybe you'll give them that or pull off some bullet points from that and say, hey, look, we're going no smoking because um, I want to reduce the risk of fire, I want a healthier building. Um, you know, it's just all in all a good move. And so give them a, give them a few reasons why you're going smoke free. In, in these other properties, they have meetings, they work with all the visiting nurses, all in an effort to really engage people to understand why they're going to smoke free. So important and really works well. One thing I want to point out in the lease addendum, I didn't, uh, I didn't mention it. Uh, of course, being a lawyer, I devoted the most verbiage to your disclaimer. <laughs> so here's why I have it. But you're doing the right thing going smoke free, for instance, and, and, and everybody's behind you. What happens if you have you ride on a city street, a sidewalk, and someone smokes there and smoke comes in the building? You're going to have someone, not that you will, but you may have someone say, I thought this place was smoke free, there's smoke drifting in my window. And of course your response is, it's a city sidewalk, what can I do? So this language says you're not a guarantor of smoke free yet. You have a smoke property. But look, if smoke blows in from off the, off, on the public sidewalk, what can I do? Or if I have someone who's ignoring this rule, yeah, I'm going to enforce it. But look, it's going to take me time. I can't just go in there and kick someone out. I've got to talk to them, got to give them a chance to cure, got to go to court if I need to. 
and there have been evictions solely for violations of a no-smoking policy. But that takes time. You know, there's no self-help is not allowed in Massachusetts. And so um, that gives you the flexibility to do that so you don't get it stuck between the rock and the hard place. Challenges. Um, again, this is for larger properties. Um, you know, staff buy-in, concerns about individual rights and stuff. This is, or, or concern like, hey, this is not that important. Again, this is for larger properties that tend to be more affordable. You see a lot of pushback uh, uh, from, from people. Let's get to enforcement. Um, let's see, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna go right to this slide. So the most important thing you can do in enforcement is maintain your property as a smoke-free property. If you don't respond to complaints, people are gonna ignore the rule. That's the truth with any rule. Um, if you don't put up a sign, people aren't gonna, because people don't walk around like a lease all the time. People look at signs. They don't, you know, they don't read, read lease agreements after they have read once. Um, tell residents to inform their guests. Someone may mess up. They may have their brother over their brother smokes. Big deal, give them a written warning. You know? But you know they otherwise follow the rules. Just ask them to inform their guests. Hold them financially responsible, that is a security deposit. Um, respond quickly and consistently, designate smoke areas. We've talked about that. If you have someone else managing your pro properties, let them know. Um, you know. Really do all the things you can. It's like any other rule. If you publicize your rule and talk about why it's important and engage residents, you know, tell them, uh, then they're going to follow the rule. You may have that one person who says, forget it, I don't care. I'm a professional tenant in the sense of, you know, the bad sense of professional tenant. I've heard the term used before. Um, well, you can move to eviction if you need to. And there's some things you can do. Oops. I'll, I'll come back to that. So the first thing you want is, so the judge has the toughest job going, right? The judge's job She's got to figure out who I believe here. So I believe the tenant who's really kind of in a situation where they don't probably don't have a lot of money and they look at the landlord, owns all these properties very wealthy. You know, there's that perception. It's a perception. Okay. What really matters is who do I believe? Who's got the thickest spot? Alright, so the moment you get a complaint, uh, add it to your file already. You've already got a file and statement of conditions, right? pictures, all that stuff, they've signed it, it's good condition. That really shows the, the judge you really care about your property. Have that in your file first. Get a complaint, to put that in your file first. If the other tenant who's complaining wants a writ, give you something right, great. If not, you put it in your evidence log and you write it in there for them. Uh, go over and check it out, smell outside the door. You get a complaint about loud music, you're gonna go check it out. You just complain about smoking, you're gonna go check it out. Smell outside the door first, then knock. Don't go in without permission, don't go in without notice, of course. Uh, don't stand outside the window and try to take a picture in the window. You don't <laughs> need that. That's not, that's not evidence that's needed. Uh, really what's persuasive is your, your you know, line, white piece of paper with a date, with a description of what you did, what happened, in different ink and pencil so you didn't just write it the night before. That's persuasive. Letters to the tenant, giving the tenant a chance to cure. Um, there was a report of smoking in your unit this day. As you know, it's a no-spoken property. It's a no-spoken property for health and safety reasons. This is your first warning. Please refrain from smoking again. Um, if you have any problems or have any questions about this notice, please do not hesitate to contact me. Have two of those in the file before you start. You know, give them two chances. I don't know. Maybe you don't, but give them two chances. Be a little flexible there. Um, you'll know who's going to be problematic, and they'll go through those two chances really quick. Um, but what you're showing the judge now is you've got a copy of the lease addendum. You've got a copy of the letter you sent out before they signed the lease addendum that describes why you're smoke-free. You've got the two warning letters. You have a picture of your no-smoking sign. You have this statement of conditions. You've documented the fact that you're a really good landlord and done everything you can to keep this a health, health, healthy and safety, safe property. And the judge is going to say, I believe you. You're a good landlord. 
You're one of those good guys. Um, so that's the evidence you really need. A lot of people ask, is there a piece of equipment, scientific equipment, that can detect secondhand smoke? Yes. I don't think you need it. Because you're going to get before the judge, and you're going to have this expensive report that says there's smoke in the property. The judge is really going to like that. And if you ever need to go in front of this judge again, the judge is going to say, hey, where's that report? And you're going to say, I can't afford 1500 bucks every time on a report. Uh, so you don't need it. Uh, just, you know, the course, like any other rule, document your file, um, written complaints from other residents, your own writings in there. I will go over some of the equipment. So here's what they have. There's a $600 badge, like a sticker. You put it up on the wall, like a radon detector. You know, same, same thing. Put it on the wall, stays there for a few days. Send it away, you get a report back. Yes, there's secondhand smoke or not. $600, pretty expensive. Yeah, it's, that, this is based on scientific, they used to do a lot of scientific, they still do scientific studies about smoking bars and stuff like that. This is the, this is the thing they use, they put the thing up on the wall. Um, there's another one called a particulate sensor matter, the sensor device. And this is a common piece of equipment that industrial hygienists and some health departments use all the time, and it detects uh, uh, little particles in the air. And so they stand outside and take a reading. They stand in the hallway and they take a reading. And they stand right outside the smoker's door and they take a reading and they see a spike in particulate matter. They say, ah, uh -huh. okay, there's smoke in the air. What does that cost? Oh, thousands. <laughs> so I think that's over a thousand a piece of equipment and plus it's a piece of equipment. Again, I don't think you need it. There is a new product. I have no financial interest in it. It's, it's being tested now. It's about the size of my smartphone, I guess a little bit bigger. And it actively detects second and smoke like a, like a smoke detector. And it beeps. Or it sends a signal to your computer, like an email. So that is coming online. There's certainly a demand for it. Um, actually, not in this context, but for, ho for uh, hotels, believe it or not. Because they'll put that thing up, it goes off, they ding the person's credit card for 300 bucks. Big money maker. So uh, this thing should be coming online. It's being it's being tested uh, right now. Um, I don't have any more information on it, but uh, certainly uh, uh, we'll try to get it out to folks once it does come online. Uh, it's cheap. Uh, you know, I think it's I think it's like the the I talked to the inventor. It's out of Dartmouth uh, and some other guys, and they were thinking like 150, something like that. So it's pretty cheap. Um, but again, it's not ready. I wish I, I wish I had one. We could, we could put it right up and test it. Uh, a few things, one more thing on enforcement, and I don't think I have two things on enforcement. Let's do this one first. Um, so reasonable accommodation. And I'll, I'll talk about this slide with a story. Um, the Milford Connecticut Housing Authority went smoke-free years ago. The executive director is a great guy, former state rep, Anthony Basilio. I'm never going to forget his name. He's this animated, wonderful guy. He, uh, uh, he actually got one of those particular sensor matters, sensitive devices. Before he even turned around, he walked around his property with it, and everybody thought it was on, so the compliance levels went up. <laughs> really kind of funny story. But the day after he went smoke-free, he got a letter from the doctor of one of the residents. And the letter said, my patient needs to have a waiver from your new rule. She suffers from anxiety, depression, some other things. Uh, so she needs a reasonable accommodation of letting her smoke. Uh, and so Anthony responded as he properly, and he said, we received your accommodation request. Uh, we need a little more information to process this request. And they had a series of questions. And one of them was, would you please point to the clinical guidelines from the American Medical Association, or American Psychiatric Association, or any clinical guidelines that says smoke is a treatment for anything? Never heard from the doctor again. Just vaporized, disappeared. The, the truth is that smoking is not a treatment for anything. Smoke them if you got them. Let's take a 10 minute smoking break. It's not a treatment. There's no nexus between I have a condition and smoking 
alleviates that condition. Um, there have been some incidents of, and this is rare, I bring this up, this is very rare. There have been some incidents, and Diane was mentioning one earlier, I've, I've heard of two at the Boston Housing Authority where a, 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 a counselor said my, my person needs to, be, my patient um, needs to be able to smoke, and they denied it, and nothing ever came of it. Um, because you can't make that connection, you can't make that nexus. Even if one can make that argument, it would be a fundamental alteration of your property, of your rule, to allow smoking. Right? Well, whole... had that medical marijuana card. Yeah, that's a good question. Same thing. Uh, well, it's a different analysis there. And the, and the reason is because of what we talked about before, that the medical marijuana law is a law at the state level only. And so federal law says there's no such thing as medical marijuana. So when push came to shove in a lawsuit, um, you would say, look, Your Honor, I can't allow smoking mar medical marijuana or any type of marijuana on my property because that's a violation of federal law. In fact, federal law says, thou shall not, making it biblical in a way, but this is what it says, thou shall not allow the use of Schedule One drugs in your property. Or knowingly allow. And if you give a reasonable accommodation to allow someone to use a Schedule One drug, darn sure knew what you were doing. Uh, so you're violating federal law. The state law says you don't have to violate federal law. Nothing in here requires anybody to violate federal law. So not only does federal law trump state law, but even state law says you don't have to do it. So yeah, if someone comes to you with a card, you can say, I have a no smoking rule. If you need to smoke it, you're going to go outside to the designated smoke mirror or off the property. If you ingest medical marijuana in other ways, so what do you think of someone? Let's run the scenario through. Are you thinking of someone in a wheelchair or something like that? Or? Well, for whatever reason they have the car. Yeah. Whatever reason they, I mean, it's got to be medical. Yeah. So are they identifying themselves as a handicapped person, right. which falls into one of the categories that is discriminatory? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not discriminating because your rule is a no smoking rule that applies to everybody. Right. And you don't have to, you know, the, the, you're not, the person can still administer the medicine to themselves in a non-combustive way, um, so it's not discriminatory. But I can see, I can see how this does become confusing, and, but it's going to be up to you to clarify this for the residents. And, and I think the best way to do that is to be very respectful of them, because chances are they are suffering from the condition. And I think it actually could be mental or physical, but they probably really are suffering. And I think the right thing to do, so let's forget about the law for a second, but the right thing to do is to be very clear. Okay, um, does this mean you're going to smoke or ingest it in other ways? Because my understanding is, this is me playing you, my understanding is there are a variety of ways that you can administer medical marijuana. So if you want to smoke it, you have to go outside. Okay, uh, if you want to ingest it in other ways, that's fine. Um, but that's in full compliance with my no-smoking no policy. And you're just very clear, you don't have to worry about the underlying rationale, you can worry about that later if you need to, but just be very clear with them about that. And there are, so they may say, look, I want something with a very high dose response. Like eating brownies may not do it for them. The smoking really gets you high quick. And, and, that's, the, and that's, part, that's part of the medicinal value of it, okay? But um, there are, like liquids now, where it's a very, very fast dose response. Ingestion, so dose and response. And they can get that without smoking it. So this is a fair balance, and it complies with the no smoking rule, and it doesn't bother other residents, too. Um, so we'll see how this plays out. It's been in place in a few other, in a few other states. The state of Washington, the Housing Authority, someone was being evicted from marijuana use, and the person said, it's medical and it legitimately was, or at least they had all the credentials. And the federal judge said, what do you want me to do? It's illegal under federal law. I can't, I can't give you this accommodation and upheld the eviction. So it has played out in other states. Will we see some lawsuits on this? Of course, we're, we're seeing lawsuits already around the dispensaries. Uh, but I don't think it's gonna play out in this way as much. Um, and reasonable accommodation too, just in general smoking, you don't have to worry about it. 
Last thing, what people really have to worry about uh, is the person who has asthma and says, look, I want a smoke-free apartment. I can't breathe when it's smoky in here. I had to go to the emergency room twice. That's the reasonable combination request you want to worry about. That's the legitimate one. Uh, another reason for smoke -free. One other thing on, um, that, that's actually the basis for this lawsuit, uh, and I won't bother going over it. One other thing, okay, it's 4 o'clock, so we'll just wrap it up. Um, if you, so evictions are very rare. We've gone back to landlords and we've asked them, how's it going? There's a, really, there's a really high level of compliance. Even in housing authorities that have a high smoke rate, very high level of compliance. Might you lose some residents who, who you have now who currently smoke? Yeah, you might. Um, but a lot of people actually quit. Um, and a lot of smokers actually like the rule. Many of them even go outside already. Um, so the message to them is, you know, they come to you with questions about it, and you say, look, you're a great tenant. We've known each other for five years or ten years. I hope you stay. This rule is not personal. All the places are going smoke free. Uh, and I'm just doing what all the other places are doing. So please stay. Just take it outside. Just like in a restaurant. Same message, same thing. Um, last thing evictions, if you do get to it, and again, I said they were rare, keep doing that engagement and education right up to the point send out the letters, sit down with them, say, look, what's going on? You keep violating this rule. Don't make me have to call my lawyer and do the eviction. Um, if you go to court and you're unsure about this, some the little trick is you can go before the judge first and tell the judge, look, judge, I, I don't want an eviction right now. I just want you to order my tenant to comply with this rule. And the judge will wag her finger at the, at the tenant. And the judge is happy to do that, happy because the judge doesn't have to evict the person. And that's a tough decision to do. Uh, so very happy. And when the person goes back in front of the judge, let's say a few weeks later, now you have the person who's violating the judge's order, well, that's a totally different ballgame for violating your lease. Uh, so now the judge is like, look, you were in here three weeks ago and I told you not to smoke, and now I've got all these other complaints and you're smoking again. So that can be an expensive process. It can be an expensive process. You can go for a temporary restraining order, which is easier to get. And you don't have to go through the notice to quit and all that stuff. You're just going for the, you're just asking for a temporary restraining order. Through housing court? Uh, through housing court. Yeah, ask your attorney about how to do that. Um, you're basically just asking for the order. And it shows, it, what it does is it illustrates for the judge that you're really taking steps to be thoughtful about giving every chance you can to the residents. But you're absolutely right. It can get expensive. When you get to eviction, it's going to get expensive. That's why you want to do things to avoid it. Um, this is almost a, an afterthought. So we're not seeing a lot of laws on this. I don't just think we're going to see any in the near future. Uh, there are a few states that have done things like, um, you know, lead paint disclosure stuff. You know, you got disclosed to the residents, particularly when you buy a house, you got disclosed to the residents. Same thing with smoking. They're thinking, oh, if we require landlords who allow smoking to disclose it, then prospective residents will go elsewhere. There's really no proof that that works, but a few states have passed that law. A um, few towns out in California have, have banned smoking multi-unit dwellings to, with a variety of exceptions, but we're not seeing a lot of laws on this. This is really driven by market forces. And again, it's basically the fact that most people don't smoke. And so now what we're going through is, again, I'm no economist, but we're catching up with demand, right? Our multi-unit housing stock is going to start reflecting the fact that a lot of people don't smoke. Current smoking rate is 16. It's um, a little higher down here, or up here. <laughs> um, and it varies from city to city. But it's, it's, not, it's not huge anywhere. It's not where it was not long ago. Could be, could be. People get go back to that. I think I think it could be. You know, it's like the uh, it's a vice. People tend to pick it up. But uh, mm -hmm. still, though, in general, the smoke rates come down an amazing amount. It used to be over thirty percent easily. Is any, what was it like twenty years ago? Forty-two percent nationally. Forty-two percent. Yeah. Wow. Not long ago. That's Not good. long ago. 
So it's come way down. I mean, smoking is, and, and, I mean, for good reason. I mean, it kills more people than all homicides, suicides, drug use, car accidents combined by far. AIDS included, everything combined. Um, that's a lot of people. And a lot of non-smokers, too, it kills. So it's come way down, and our multi genesis stock is, gonna, is, is changing to reflect that fact. So where are we going to be five, ten years from now? <laughs> you know, most places are going to be smoke-free. Those that aren't, that's where the smokers are going to come. So, uh, and that's when we may see laws on this, on this issue. Uh, I guess I do have another slide here. I'll just mention it quickly. Um, we did a survey of municipal housing authorities. And as of, let's see, prior to 09, not one housing authority was smoke free. But since then, we have over 50 housing authorities representing 20,000 units going smoke free. Boston, Springfield, big ones, small ones. Um, New Bedford, so a lot of places are going smoke free. Um, and that's it. That's it. Um, got some more material, so before you folks go, please come by and get these. And there's some up there. Um, and this is. This, this number's on the That's me. It's a toll-free number. If you want to call, I have some questions. Um, I'm happy to try to answer them. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, and um, if, you, you know, if you go smoke-free, um, advertise it and let, and let folks know. Uh, yeah, please get this copy and use them as you would like. And, and if you want, if I can email you versions of these, and you can cut and paste and use anything you want from them. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you.